This is breaking news from the Las Vegas Review Journal. Sponsored by Michael Gaughan's South Point Hotel, Casino and Spa. Good morning, everyone. I'm Renee Summerauer with the Las Vegas Review Journal. We're getting ready to take you to Illusions Salon of Beauty, where Governor Steve Sisolak is meeting with black business owners here in Southern Nevada to discuss their ongoing recovery efforts, the challenges they face, and also their successes. Let's take a listen. celebrating 16 years. Once before we were named the SBA Nevada Family Owned Business of the Year. Um, I echo a lot of things that um, Brandon talked about, but one of the things that I'm always working on is a special thing we did to pivot um, for, the, uh, for the pandemic was we had employees who had kids who couldn't go to school. So we turned one of our offices into a little place, their own room, we call it their family room, where they could come in and um, family members feel good, parents feel good, come in and help them keep their kids safe, as well as have the opportunity for them to bond and the kids really enjoy the atmosphere. So that's, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges for I think some of the small businesses and some of the employees is childcare. So we, we think small businesses can help out with that um, in, in, in the way that we work as a family and business. I'll go next. I'm Joe Cato. Hi, Joe. And good to see you hi, good to see you. And um, I, I own Periwinkle Media Group along with Cruising Vegas Outdoor Advertising, a mobile billboard company. I've been in business for 16 years with Shondell. We kind of started off together. And um, uh, for me, we were named SBA Minority Owned Business of the Year a few years ago. And um, we were in, I was named Entrepreneur of the Year twice. And so uh, for me, for my business and how we had to pivot last year, there were so many programs that the state, the county provided that we were able to participate in and that helped us to stay in business during the pandemic. And I have some ideas as to other things we could do that we could touch on later. But I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Joe Cato. And I'm from Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> I am Taisha Moore, and I am the treasurer of the Urban Chamber of Commerce. But uh, one, uh, in addition to that, my husband and I are um, electrical contractors, and we own G3 Electrical. And we have been in business now. We're celebrating our 12th year in business. So we actually started our construction business during the last recession. So um, that, that was that was definitely a bumpy ride for us, um, but it was it was definitely worth it, and we're we're still here even after the pandemic. And so I just want to say thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm Jessica Washington, the owner of Vegas Valley Balloons and Events, and I've been in business for almost two years. I will say I'm probably one of the businesses that thrived through the pandemic without any grants or loans like people wanted to celebrate. So we offered um, no contact deliveries and yard deliveries, and um, thanks to the Urban Chamber and the resources they provided, um, I'll say I'm doing good. <laughs> We have two more back here as well. You can go in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay, hi, hi. Dewana Malone. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, AKA the Tech Team. And uh, 2022 Grand Marshal for the Dr. Yes. Martin Luther King Committee, mm -hmm. my colleague. Um, I want to echo what this young lady said. I am the ex executive director of Nevada Health Desk. 
And uh, during the pandemic, we too really thrived during that time. Uh, 10 times increased our income, so we didn't leave any that we're in the technology industry, so everybody came to our space during the pandemic and really needed the services that we provide. Um, as an African American computer programmer, I co lead the Urban Chambers IT Roundtable, have been in business since 1998, but the Nevada Help Desk Project started in 2018. And Governor Fislack, I have to give you a shout out because our first grant was through the Office of Science, Innovation, and Technology. Good. And our second grant was through the Office of Science, Innovation, and Technology under your office. And then right after then, Google, Verizon, all of your major tech companies joined forces with the initial grants that you gave, and they're all our tech partners now. Every major tech brand from Google to Verizon, you name it, have joined Wonderful. efforts for our state to invest in technology in demand occupations right here for Nevada. Wonderful. Thank Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Hayward Burns. I'm the uh, owner of Unfatable Master Barbershop. We uh, unfortunately were affected when uh, the shutdown happened, and uh, we were not able to receive any funds uh, due to various reasons, but we were able to survive. Uh, we were exceptionally glad when you lifted and we were able to go back to work and make some money. <laughs> um, so, I think the problem with us were, uh, was just the uh, knowing where to turn, where to go, and by the time we got there, uh, the funds was exhausted. So, you know, that's the problem we ran into, but we're still here. Good. Okay, I wrote down what I was going to answer for you. My name is Tiffany. Um, this is my husband, Patrick, at Halor, and together we manage two businesses here in the state of Nevada as well as hosting um, and chair of the Urban Chamber of Commerce Global Roundtable. Um, uh, as a native Nevadan, wife and mother, I was raised and born in Carson City. And uh, our business, Tribal Exchange Global LLC, has been in creation since 2010. And Tribal Exchange's Global's mission is to evolve the connection from Africa to the US, agricultural import and export commerce. Um, Tribal Exchange Global Imports farmed products such as tea leaves, cocoa seeds, oils from Nigeria while manufacturing, assembling, and distributing nationally from the state of Nevada. Uh, opening and operating Tribal Exchange has been a challenge in the means of partnership for capital startup funds and locating global assistance within the state of Nevada for administrative permits, license, and regulations for the global market. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Pennington. I'm the owner of Daily Printing and the Custom T-shirt. I started my business 13 years ago. Uh, I've seen the change now because back then, it was difficult for me to get funding. Wherever I went, it was hard. I had about four to $500 and took a chance. Mm -hmm. Now I had six employees, I'm over the second location, and I've seen changes within the banks now, helping my early on business. Uh, you know, uh, Bank of Nevada had a program that I was able to get loans from. Pay that back. So um, that have changed a lot over the period of time. The other thing that I'd like to see a lot of if these new organizations, sports organizations, is coming to Vegas, is put in a position where they have to have a minority business involved in their uh, distribution or becoming a vendor. Because me being a printing company, I have a lot of opportunity to print. But by the time I get to the table, the big boys have made a deal already that minority owned business like myself don't get in the door. So those I'd like to see something like that where they put in a position, it's not where we're getting a free pass. We're just saying, hey, we'd like you to apply for it. Let's give you a go. If I mess up, then you get rid of me, but the idea is to be successful at it. So I'd like these companies to get a little bit of encouragement to hire more minority business or give opportunities. Not a handout, but opportunities. Right. Okay, so that's what I'm looking for. The funding part is great. The other part that all small business owners right now have it is probably getting employees back to work. I'm just hoping that we don't get any more free money out to them because we do need them back to work and I don't know if there's any incentive to get them back, but that's the problem that we're having right now, getting qualified people to come back to work. Uh, and that's it, but apart from that, 
you know, Nevada has been great to me the last few years. We were able to apply for the PPP, the idle loan, and that kept us going. So I'm going to take care of as well. The ones that were able to survive. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, they're still home. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> so that's it, basically. I mean, we're doing fine right now, apart from the employee side of things, but our business is still succeeding. I just want to be able to get in certain doors that don't always use the open for me. That's what I'm looking for. You're not alone on the employee situation. Yeah. Every I, I, business I yeah. talk to has got an employee situation. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, there's not any more federal subsidies coming. Uh, but we've got a real employment problem. We've got, you know, tens of thousands of people looking for a job, and we've got jobs. We just have a match to come up, and, and that's really unfortunate. I don't know what these people have done because there's they got to survive. they got to make money. So I don't know if people are coming back to work. For a while it was child care, and then we opened the schools back up, so they were able to get kids in school. And uh, we got to get everybody back to work because I know employers are really stretched, and they've increased wages drastically. Yeah. We're good then, yeah. Good. All right, now, uh, I'll just say uh, good morning and uh, thank you, everyone. My name is Ken Evans. I'm the president for the Urban Chamber of Commerce on behalf of our board. There's members, several of which are here, as well as our membership. I've uh, been at the chamber eight and a half years now, so I've seen some of the efforts to come back from the recession, the things we went through in terms of uh, most recently uh, COVID. And from my standpoint, I'm just happy to see uh, first of all, thank you for the chance to provide input for the recovery and resiliency plan. What we tell people, we have two priorities. Number one, diversify and expand the economy. And then number two, make sure that there's diversity, equity, and inclusion mm -hmm. as we're doing number one. So to echo what many of my members have said here, as we move forward, we just want to make sure that we get an opportunity to participate, grow our businesses, create jobs, and be part of moving forward. Out of so thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Ken's not mentioning, he's also on the stadium authority, which is a <laughs> huge, huge benefit for us when we uh, built that stadium, provided thousands of jobs, construction jobs, and now ongoing uh, events that they're having there is generating a lot of tax dollars for the state and providing jobs along the way. So thanks for putting in some time on that. We appreciate it. Appreciate you doing it. Awesome. We'll move to more of an open floor discussion. Everybody should feel comfortable to, to speak on this talk, on this prompt, rather. But um, we want to hear a little bit about how your experience as a Black Nevadan influenced your approach to operating operating and owning a business in Nevada. So whoever wants to start, go ahead. Can you repeat that? Yeah, sorry, repeating the question. So um, we want to hear a little bit about how your experience as a Black Nevadan influences and influences your approach to operating and owning a business of your own. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with, uh, it goes back to what John said before, and, and even sometimes now, is access to capital. What's real important to note is that um, there are a lot of, and we understand the capacity issue when it comes to employment, like, you know, once upon a time, there were like, uh, you know, 2.1 million black-owned businesses in the country, but only less than 4% have employees. So some of us that have employees are an anomaly, right? So, but the, 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 the lenders, we have to be more creative with lenders, right? We have uh, some, uh, some new lending options, alternative lending, um, just like uh, Access uh, CDFI is one of those. We need some more of those CDFIs that lend to us. We learned during PPP and during IDLE, or during PPP, that that first round was kind of bogus uh, because some of us had banking relationships. Some of us had banking relationships for 15 years, <laughs> but that was the excuse for them not lending. Well, while every, and, and it goes back to what John was saying. Everybody else grabs and then leaves us the leftovers. And then when they gave us the leftovers, they didn't want to give us all the money that we had even applied for. So that's that's always been an issue. It, and and that, it, that has been, and I like the fact that you said something, um, Governor, a few years ago. You, you, you pointed out how race is an issue and you put it as a priority um, mm -hmm. for, you, for you as your administration. So and most people are not bold enough to say that. So we, we, we do look for opportunities when it comes to lending, resources. It's gotten better because this state, and, and I'll give it to our Nevada State Legislature, 
they have been way better than most of my colleagues who are around the country, but it still needs work. Okay. But the banking, banking institutions have improved in terms of the, the, availability? The, the, yeah, banking, the banking institutions always lean on saying that the regulators are the ones that's keeping them from it. So the old school of, hey, I know you, you know me, you met me, they're still handcuffed. Mm -hmm. The local lenders, are, the SBA lenders, are still handcuffed because they're, they're, they're owned by corporations. Right. That makes sense. Okay. And if I could uh, hop in on that note very quickly to build on what he mentioned about access to community capital, which hopefully will be a CDFI. CDFIs are important because even if the banks can't directly lend to people that have two or three years in business or less, to the extent that they can invest in a CDFI and then the CDFI can deploy that capital, that still helps us out as business owners to get access to the capital. Okay. Okay. I have a comment um, that we're talking about suggestions and solutions um, for our state. I would say um, our apprenticeship program here for the state of Nevada, uh, particularly for minorities and um, in the apprenticeship program and even starting and registering the apprenticeship program, that process could really be uh, streamlined a little bit more. Um, it took us two weeks to become a national registered apprenticeship program in the state of Nevada. It took nine months in the state of Nevada to get a registered apprenticeship program a registered. That same process was only two weeks for the national. Mm -hmm. that, that took nine months in the state of Nevada. So I'm only mentioning that because I know there's a demand for skilled workers in technology, particularly to diversify, oops, to diversify uh, that industry. And folks are trying to figure out, well, why is it so hard to recruit African Americans or any minority in uh, the technology field for apprenticeship? Well, I can personally say that the process is so difficult that a lot of people may not persist until they succeed, as we did. And that could be a part of the problem, which could easily be fixed by duplicating some of what National is doing. So I, whatever I need to do to help be a part of that problem, since we can recently- Can you give me a little bit more specifics in terms of what, if they're making you jump through more hoops, or they may- Absolutely. It is so, and then, like the first meeting, the first apprenticeship council we were at, you know, you had the pen, and then the meetings are only held a couple times a year versus every month. There's a lot of, you know, I don't know if you're in the public, but I can give you a list because I've been documenting the process so I can share on even a national level how to help other states. But my, my concern is that since there's an issue of really trying to diversify this industry with more African Americans in technology and even registering apprenticeship programs, it's a lot of hoops they have to go through to just get an apprenticeship program started in the state of Nevada. Okay, so you're talking about the company getting them started, not recruiting people to go into the program. Oh yeah, not recruiting people. We partner with the school district, so we don't have any issues getting students. This is registering the apprenticeship program in the state of Nevada. Okay, if you could get the details to Randy yeah, before I sure we leave we'll later. We'll connect right after. This is something. I, I sure can. I definitely want to follow and up on And then we that. can offer solutions sure, on how to yeah, diversify great. that. Thank Good. you. Um, yeah, so again, the question, share your experience as a black, as how being a black Nevadan influences your approach to operating and owning a business in Nevada. Uh, I'll, I'll hop in. Although currently I've been at the chamber for eight and a half years, what I want to share is that I was a business owner as well uh, years ago doing real estate development. As a black Nevadan, uh, I'm not from here, but I've been here 30 years uh, since the military. What I'll share with you is that you do run into the perception that, in some cases, I'm an engineer. The very same job that I could do if I was employed by someone else, when I went to start my consulting company, all of a sudden, well, we're not sure if you're good enough or strong enough to do the very same exact thing that I was getting paid very well to do in the private sector before that the federal government. So I think sometimes people's biases, prejudices, uh, impact how they view us as business owners, instead of giving us an equal opportunity, the automatic assumption, and I'll, I'll build on this and then I'll stop this, when we talk about small disadvantaged business enterprises, we may want to consider getting away from that term. Yes, we need the program, but be careful about the term because unfortunately, I have business owners, black business owners that have said, 
can, I'm not going to get the certification because the automatic assumption is I'm not good enough, I don't have the capacity, I don't have the experience because of this title, instead of recognizing that the certification is merely an avenue to get an opportunity and get in the door, but I'm just as competent as my possible competition. Got it. Good question. Uh, I, I would like to echo what Ken said as, as a, a, a electrical contractor in construction. We know that construction is predominantly a white male-dominated industry. Um, being a minority woman-owned electrical contractor, we have experienced that exact, exact scenario. And we are certified, but we are a little bit cautious with sharing that information. Um, we're even down to building our website. We're a little bit cautious of, of even putting our pictures on there because we understand that there are biases that are, are out there. People do their research on the internet. They want to see what the company's all about. Who are we? And so we, we have had to face those decisions, and um, I, I totally agree. Brandon, you to I was going to say, touch on what Ken was saying. It didn't make sense that you have to be a black certified business in order, or a minority you know, certified business in order to do business with a bigger company. If every other company is coming in certified, then that's understandable. But that's not the case. Why do we have to make, make a to prove that we're adequate enough to do business? Is that because there's a carve out to get businesses, minority businesses? What is the reason for that, Kevin? From, from my perspective, yes, unfortunately. And I didn't mean to cut you off, but it will No, I'll, I'll do one. Unfortunately, what happens sometimes is the only way we get opportunities is if, to your point, we use the carve out or participation. The only, sometimes the only way we get an opportunity is if by law, legislation, there's a participation rate that is communicated, and then as a way of making sure that people don't play the game with that participation rate, that's the reason why we have the certification. But I think what many of us are expressing is, to go back to what Dr. King said, we want, to, we want our businesses to be judged by our competency, our capacity, our ability to compete and succeed. In fact, when we talk to our chamber members, we say, be prepared to compete and succeed, but unfortunately, sometimes, the only way we get the opportunity to compete and succeed is by going through the certification process, and then there's a participation rate. So until people get to a point where they can open up their hearts, heads, and minds to allow people to be afforded an opportunity, regardless of the color of their skin, we need these programs. And to, to add to what she said, I operate a, a business that's predominantly Caucasian male, mobile billboards. Mm -hmm. I'm the only black-owned mobile billboard company in the entire state. But can I proudly say that? No, because the moment I did, maybe two or three years ago, my business dwindled. Mm. So I had to change my website <laughs> and just say mobile billboards without me, as an, I'm, I'm an employee for the company, and then business picked up. And even though I'm certified, I've done all the certification with the hope that that would get me in the door to do some advertising on the strip, in the community or whatever, it just didn't work. I, I, I cannot go into these organizations, whether private or public, and say I'm minority owned, I'm black owned. I just, I, I just don't have those opportunities. So maybe if they're programmed, right you know, yeah. for, for us participation, as Ken mentioned, then that would give us the opportunity to have a level playing field. We're not asking for a handout. So it was viewed as an advantage at the beginning is not attributed to a mm -hmm. disadvantage. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I always think um, some cool leverage for the state of Nevada could be the diversity of the global hub being the state of Nevada. So we have people from all over the world constantly coming here. So rebranding the idea of helping small business owners of diversity, global relations, and just um, creating at the state level a protocol for partnerships between these small business diverse global um, entities with already established corporations here. Make it a protocol on state level. So we're not talking about my dad's white, my mom's black, my husband's Nigerian. We're just talking about global relations ethical on a national level and then reaching out on a global level because it's a global market now after COVID. Yeah. Okay. 
I think the model um, that we did at the stadium is one that it should be replicated. Because once you open the door to the small businesses, as he was saying, then you open the door to the minority businesses and yes. you make sure that you have yes. you have equity all the way around and access. And I think that the biggest thing for the chambers, our role is to prepare these businesses to compete yes. in a global economy. Yes. So I think it's important that we we, we work in partnership and, and unfortunately We've had a great partnership. Uh, Chris Sanchez, we Ken and I talk to him on a regular basis. We go in, and he always keeps us connected on getting our, our many of our businesses opportunities. Um, and, and we always talk about diversifying the economy. And, and once you have equity and all of that, look at Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball has excelled not because Jackie Robinson broke the color lines, but because Jackie Robinson gave access, and now all these people from all around the world. We, we don't want to minimize it to he just brought in black, but he opened the doors to the Koreans, the, the Japanese, the Chinese. Look at, look at the global approach. Now, television revenue grows everything, and the Raiders themselves, they've done that as well. Mm -hmm. The Raiders started out, Al Davis was the first one to recruit from HBC, right. mm -hmm. understanding the economic value. So not just going and saying, I want to be a nice guy. I just want to give Brandon a chance. Understand economic value yes. that comes from black-owned businesses. That's that's what we really want is that's to understand it. how the value can raise the overall economic success. Of the yeah, state. Truth be told, the Raiders are helpful to, to doing that, but you guys fought like crazy to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, I remember those meetings you know, very very well. <laughs> and without your efforts, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, yeah. truth be told, yes. it just would not have happened. And it wasn't just minority businesses; it got cut down to black businesses. And, you know, women-owned businesses that, you know, made it possible. Yeah. And they, the Raiders agreed in the construction and on the vending and on the uh, other aspects of their business. So that took a lot of effort by the Urban Chamber if I, and you guys in general to make it happen. And I appreciate that because it, it did give a lot of folks an opportunity that otherwise would not have existed. So maybe we need to work in front of it. Just to jump on that as well, you just said it just on the Urban Chamber before we really hard. They did. Right, but we need other people to fight for us like that too. Right. And that's what we're hoping to see here with you because they can't be everywhere, but we want other people who's inside the office around the table to fight for minority on this okay. because everyone here said exactly what I've been through. Mm -hmm. I can't put my picture on my website. I have a 100% black business. Mm -hmm. All my employees are black. I'm only black storefront here in Vegas. Can I go market that? No. no. I can't do that. I mean, it's so sad. Mm -hmm. So. We can't be in that position to fight every battle. That's why we need someone like yourself mm. to fight for us inside that office. Yeah. And force people, it's sad to do that, force them to make changes. Yeah. Give us opportunity. Yeah. They have to. I mean, I saw like the NFL right now. They have to interview so many coaches to take, check that box. We don't just want to check a box. We want you to actually interview us and give us a job. Give them a chance, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what See, the stadium about. was a little different because there was public funds going yeah. in there. When there's public yeah. funds, I can exert a lot more pressure, influence, whatever you want to call it. When it's a private sector, it's not so easy to say, hey, look, Caesar Palace or MGM or Boyd, you got to start doing this mm -hmm. because we're not giving them any resources. But those are good things that they need to know. You're absolutely right. And, and what I would suggest, Governor, is the good thing is what we do with the stadium sets an example of what's possible. Although we may have started with a legislatively uh, inactive participation rate, once we get people in there and they perform, they show that they're competent, and plus they build relationships, after a while they get natural opportunities moving forward. So again, I'll go back to that's the reason why we appreciate the opportunity to provide input to the recovery and resiliency plan because we know what we want to do to diversify and expand the economy. So if we implore individuals within the state agencies to use our vendors, our consultants, they build relationships plus demonstrate their competence. After a while, naturally and normally, we'll get more business. Right. Good. Okay. Good little question. Anybody else have that? Well, my final question was in one word or sentence, how can the state help you all and support you all in your businesses? We've talked a lot about that here today, but if you had to bake it down to one word or one sentence, 
what could we take from this today? I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with one, and it may be sensitive, but I'm aware of the fact that there are state legislators that have asked for a disparity plan to be done, and then possibly action taken to open up procurement opportunities for businesses like the ones that are represented here today. So my sentence would be consider doing a state-based disparity plan and then taking some action on the recommendations for procurement that come on here. I think, I think you've heard it from everybody is not recognizing as a minority or disadvantage, mm -hmm. but looking at the value mm -hmm. that is brought to the, the process. And, and we fought hard. The reason why we fought hard, because we knew, we didn't do it just to have people show up. We knew that we had players. We had Duana, we had Joe, we had, you know, we had John Pennington. We had people that could perform on some of those contracts. So we don't, we're looking to make sure that they get those equitable opportunities, not sidelined or looked over because this is what we've always done, right? We participate on a few state contracts. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it was kind of leaning towards Northern Nevada because they had the relationships with the people who were making the yeah. decisions. We had to go in and, we're and working fight. On we had, yeah, we, we, and we're still fighting that yeah. one. Mm -hmm. So we got to make sure that it's equitable again. Like, all, we're doing all the business here, and I'm not I'm not trying to do a North and South thing, but like you said, you're working on it because we just because we're not sitting in their face and have the ability to go up and have lunch with them doesn't mean we shouldn't be privy to those contracts. Right. right. That's the absolute truth, yeah. If I can chime in on that question, I'm sorry, but I'm going to speak up for my mom and my uncle of a, <laughs> <laughs> a way to help within their industry would also be to diversify the state boards that govern what they do. So the State Board of Cosmetology and for barbers, getting uh, more inclusivity on those boards who mm -hmm. understand the hair care needs of uh, the black community, right? Because they're different and they vary. So if we can get individuals on that board who know what they do, who can kind of help govern and, and oversee their work, I think that would be helpful within the industry of cosmetology and for barbers. Yeah. And that's a great point for no, no, the, that's absolutely true. And the one area that we could use help on is the boards and commissions. I had an appoint. I had a meeting yesterday. I do this. Seems like every well, other week. Every other week <laughs> seems like it's every day. I do boards and commissions. We cannot get enough qualified people to serve on all the boards that we have. We just can't get it. I know, Joe. Joe, we're working on that. Believe me. I I'm know. Tough. So we, are <laughs> on we don't want to put you in something. I don't think you're going to be effective. <laughs> That's what, you know, I've got to get you the right board. But you know, we've got that. You're, trust me. Your I'm name ready. comes up regularly. I know. Uh, but we need more encouragement if it comes through the urban chamber. Those are great yeah. opportunities to just get more involvement in this process, which is really important to all of us. So, so, gov so, gov me, Randy. Go ahead, so go Governor, ahead. I'll make the public commitment here. The urban chamber, if we're made aware of some of the board vacancies, I'll make the public commitment that because we're about solutions, mm -hmm. we will help provide names yes. and identify. Yes. Yeah, that's great. That. I was just going to say, let us know how we can help you you make it more, like make it easier for you to know whether what vacancies there are mm -hmm. anything we'll connect mm -hmm. after Ken but we'll definitely work on that because that is something that's yep. very important to the governor and we need help with from your from you guys because yes. you're the folks on the ground who know the people who are qualified for those positions and I want to thank Joy for bringing that up because uh, yeah. there, there's a phrase I use quite often uh, whether it's our small business development center uh, system here in Nevada or just in general like boards and commissions. We need these boards and commissions and beyond that we need our small business development ecosystem infrastructure to be both professionally competent but we need it to be culturally competent mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Very good point. Yes. Very good point. I have a, yes. Go ahead. Really quick, I was going to um, echo what uh, Mr. Evans said as well. I literally just ended my term of the local workforce board here and I serve on the technology council for um, for the governor's office. But as far as what our biggest need is right now, most of our students that now that they're trained, now that they're certified, thanks to OSID and all of our partners, they're now working outside of the state of Nevada for opportunities. We can't get them to work in here. And thank, thanks to you know, the, the pandemic that we're in now that allows the work from home. But I would love to see our students, because the whole purpose of the grant and everything is to get them to work 
in our state. So I would love to see opportunities for those students that are trained, that are certified. You know, we successfully completed the grant. Now the full cycle would be that they're working in Nevada and not have to work in Illinois and Texas and Georgia and other places to utilize the skill sets that these students have to use. So we need help in that area. We have the talent. That was the problem. We need more in -skill, more skilled uh, workers. Now that we have them, can we fill those jobs here in Nevada? Mm -hmm. That's our well, We do what we can to diversify to have those job openings. You're yes. absolutely right. Yes. The gaming industry and hospitality, we cannot continue to rely on it solely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because every time there's a recession, a pandemic, a natural disaster, whatever it is, Las Vegas suffers. And that's what we need to get away from. We need to get it where we can be a little bit more resilient and flexible as a state, as a community, yeah. to keep people working because you've seen that through the recession, through the pandemic. We in Hawaii got hit harder than anybody else did because of the tourism-based mm -hmm. economy. And that's why we suffered so much. But we need to try to not eliminate that, certainly, because we're always going to be the entertainment and sports capital of the world as a result of what's happened here. But we need to also have the industry that, that yeah. uh, suits that. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. The last thing I'll bring up is one of the things that we focus on when people come in and we're talking to LBGA and all of our partners who bring in businesses and chambers. Um, when they come in, we always talk about them creating jobs, right? But they should utilize the small and minority businesses to help them with their services. Right. So there should be a two-prong approach, mm -hmm. not just, oh, we want to go hire all these people, but they should hire, they should work with the printers and the the other resources, the janitorial services, or whatever it is, look here first before they bring people in. Mm -hmm. And then that will create more jobs. Let me ask you then, how do we get to, we can't advertise as minority businesses because it proves as a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So how do we get a show that's coming in that you know wants to employ minority businesses when we don't want to make a list that these are minority-owned businesses? Mm -hmm. How do we get them to know that these are the minority-owned businesses? Because let's be candid, now, you know, they're coming from out of state, they don't know Nevada, they don't know Las Vegas, they're coming, they need t-shirts printed. How in the world do they know, what, a, is it AA printing? Mm -hmm. How in the world do they know that AA printing is, exists and that they're a minority of business? How do we make them aware of that? Uh, uh, Governor, uh, unfortunately, the best way I can word it is, for the foreseeable future, it's going to have to be a necessary evil, for lack of a better word. Intentional. Intent, there we go. A necessary, intentional thing. We have to identify people so they know. And then again, hopefully over the course of time, things will get better and happen naturally and organically. But unfortunately, we do have to identify for the foreseeable future well, to ensure we get by. Well, and it goes back to what... Um, Diversity. Diversity, Tiffany. right? Diversity. That the, Tiffany said. The biggest thing that we did, and, and when I was a marketing director of station, Joe remembers this, we went out and just said, we need to make sure that our local vendors are a part of growing stations, right? And, and the reason why that was important is because they become future clients, customers, and sure. champions for our, for our business. I think the LVCVA, the state, the municipalities, they're working towards it, but government um, sometimes moves a little bit slower unfortunately um, and but we need to move we need to move at the pace of business and the pace of the reaction of the customer so we can't so we're not being kind because that's where we that's where we can be nimble uh, as the governor talked about the more people involved in in the in the, in the economy and, and in the procurement process the better the state will be and not just having these sectors right. dominate everything so I think that the question that you asked was um, how can the state better support black or minority business, uh, small businesses? And my answer to that when I thought about it was to contract with us intentionally, mm -hmm. consistently, creatively, and responsibly. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, um, it's not a handout. It's making sure that when there's a, a procurement opportunity that we're not just relying on our favorite who we've always done business with right every single opportunity that does not have to be a multi-million dollar opportunity no. right. there are definitely smaller opportunities that we could have a shot at and and being intentional about making sure that we are including as many businesses as we can right. would even would even um take us away from saying we want to we, we want to make sure we include black businesses 
But if we're just allowing everybody to compete equally and not just give um, opportunities to our favorites or who we've always done business with, right. I think that that will help to open the door. And, and one of the things I did when I was on the county commission, we broke up contracts because, yes. for example, our landscaping contract was way too big at the county and only a massive company could come into it. So we broke it up yeah. so that somebody could take care of this park and take care of this building, take care of this. I don't know if we're doing that at the state level, but we'll certainly look at that. But even at that, how does the procurement office, and we can deal with this in terms of awarding state right. contracts and bids, what I need to know that that tech company is a minority owned business or that this printing company is a minority owned business. They have to somehow, somebody, has to be made aware that that's the kind of business we're trying to get. I think that that comes with asking questions about whoever is offering their, their numbers. For me, I'm in contracting, I'm in construction, so there have been questions, there have been GCs that have asked us what, they, they just have a, a questionnaire. And we tell them, like, if we're local, if we're, how many employees we have, some of them ask more questions than others. And so I think that the, when I said intentionally, where we're asking that those questions and we're understanding are we even doing business with local businesses? Yeah. So I think that that's important, especially if we're going to go outside of Nevada. Sure. I would hope that we would at least look at all of the qualified businesses that are that are here able first, to yeah. to serve us in that need right We've here. We've made a concerted effort to look at state-run businesses, but we need to do better in the minority businesses. Okay. And possibly in the scoring of these um, procurements you could probably have points, added points for local, like locally licensed business in our state. So that would be extra, you know, break up the 100 points to maybe five points. We did that at the marijuana and the cannabis yes. industry. Yes, yeah. yes, and, and it worked, yeah, it you know, but yeah. other other procurement opportunities, that would be a great opportunity okay. to and have that added. And if you ask questions along those lines about ownership, and show proof of ownership that can be verified with the Secretary of State website and mm -hmm. then you'll know who actually yes. owns the company Definitely. or has a principal interest in the company. Good yes. point. Good. Okay. On the, oh. Sorry, we have a hand back here. Go ahead, Ray. Um, I'm Jean Claude, I'm French Canadian. Hopefully my French accent everybody can understand it. I've been in Vegas for about five years, thanks for having us here, Governor. And I think one of the things that we realize is the what the danger of one storytelling. <laughs> what I realized about, as, as a black person, even I'm from Canada, from Africa originally, and moving to the US, there is not enough story about successful business. I work in IT, I have an MBA degree, but this, the, the, by the time people look at me, they don't see it. They don't see me as an entrepreneur because there's not enough story. But can we also find a way to promote local small businesses? When we launch our app post COVID 19, the goal was can we help local businesses to better connect with their own community? And then we start meeting with a lot of own black businesses and they just want to jump on board because they're like, nobody pay attention to us and I'm going to find a way to find a local market. So that's the danger that the problem is dealing with as well. There is not enough story. So when we go on the street in our case and meet with Bacco CEO or CIO, they don't know who we are and there is no successful story. So they'll look away, rather hire uh, you know, social marketing app coming from Silicon Valley versus to give a chance to a lot of those businesses. That's sort of something we have to be being able to promote, put a story out there about local, successful local black businesses. Okay, that's good idea. Yeah. Well, we've got the media here, so the media, you got to start telling some of these <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, And you're absolutely right. You know, every you know takes this up and you know does an emphasis during Black History Month, but yes. it's, it should be every month is you know Black History Month in terms of promoting our businesses mm -hmm. and our people. So you're absolutely right. And that's where we could you know partner more with you Ken, in making sure that when yeah. something that happens with one of these businesses and they break down another barrier, they do something great. We're getting that story out. Absolutely, because I want to put this story out there. I won't put too much of it out there, but sitting in this room right now, I, talk, I mentioned I've been at the chamber eight and a half years. We have a term called organic corporations, and what it basically means is a company that started a small business and now they're north of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. I'll just share without putting their business out there too much unless they want to share it. You know, as I look around, there's at least probably two, maybe three, of the individuals sitting here that have organic corporations, meaning they're north of a million dollars. Imagine the amount of jobs they've created, the things they put back into the community, and just in general, the corporate citizen that they've been. We want to continue to create that. 
Right. Tell that story. Yeah. I read your um, newsletter all the time. Like, I'm looking for Thank it. You. And I think it would be awesome as a native Nevadan to see in that newsletter a nook. Every single newsletter highlighting. Done. Thank you. Yeah, we're having <laughs> a, a, a great diverse, idea. Great just idea. period. Like, I know I'm going to get that in that newsletter. Right. And then we can share it, and it's like wildfire. So yeah. people understand that yeah. we are engaged. Great idea. I'm making a note here. Yeah. So writing one. I, I just wanted to use this opportunity to say thank you for this platform because, as you can see, all of these wonderful ideas when we come together collectively, so more gatherings like these throughout the year to help continue and have accountability would be very helpful. And I just wanted to give a disclaimer that uh, because I love the governor and the Office of Science and Innovation taking into the whole state, that I'm yelling only because I'm in the back. And not no, because no, I got I'm, it. Not because I'm angry. Because <laughs> 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 I'm an angry black woman. <laughs> but I'm only yelling so you can hear me, but I Thank love you. to say I love you everything. Yeah. Here, so. Thank you. What? I've got a lot of meat here. Do you guys, anybody have any specific questions they want to ask? You've got a pretty select group of business owners here. You can ask something, so I, I know this is kind of going off. I think script. we'll probably just take one on one. Okay. Yeah, yeah if uh, we can, you want to wrap this up? If somebody would not mind doing some one on ones with the media uh, to tell the story, this is our opportunity, you know what I mean, to tell the stories that need to be told and, and get it out there for people to see. And, uh, and I thank you all for being here. This has been very, very important. Breaking news from the Las Vegas Review-Journal, sponsored by Michael Gaughan's South Point Hotel, Casino, and Spa.